<clears throat> Welcome everybody and happy Tuesday. Today is, what is today? Today is um, October 12th, 2021. Um, welcome everybody to our Tim at 10. Uh, today we're going to have a redo. Uh, we actually did this webinar back in May of 2021, but some reason, for some reason, it did not record and um, had some technical issues. Uh, so uh, we're going to do a, a, a take two on this one. Good morning, Pam. How are you? Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about creating your child care licensing compliance binder today. Um, such an incredible tool to help you uh, stay in compliance with child care regulations, form an amazing relationship with them, um, and then help you just you know, keep up with uh, all of the inspections and due dates um, that is required uh, within your program. So this is a practice that I've been following for, gosh, 20 plus years now, um, and it has been so helpful to me, um, you know, in regards to licensing. And so I thought I would share it with you today. Uh, for those of you that this is your first time joining us, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, you can interact with me um, in the comment screen. You can type in questions or make comments. Uh, because you have that opportunity to interact, it makes it instructor-led. So you get instructor-led hours uh, for child care licensing uh, when you are participating live. Now, if you're watching the recorded uh, video of this, then that would be self-instructional. But if you're live with me right now on Facebook, this counts as instructor-led hours. So please uh, comment and ask questions as we go through the material. If you see something that you like, um, you know, give me a little emoji uh, down there um, in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, so give me the smiley face or the heart or, or a thumbs up. Um, you know, any of those emojis are always fun and it kind of lets me know that you're engaged and that you're uh, paying attention right there. Um, at the end of today's webinar, I will post, I will post a link uh, so that you can complete an online worksheet um, and then uh, you can get a certificate of completion. Uh, so it doesn't cost anything to watch the Facebook Live. You only have to pay $5 if you're wanting a certificate of completion. Uh, and that will be posted on Facebook at the end of our webinar. Uh, once again, all of our Facebook Lives are recorded, so if you miss any part of today's webinar, you can always go back and watch it again, or if you know a friend or coworker that would benefit from this information, they can always go back and watch it at a later time. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started with this um, awesome, awesome tool um, that I'm going to share with you today, and that is what we call our child care regulations compliance binder. So you're going to get yourself just a nice um, thick binder um, with some page protectors that um, you're going to put all of your information in. So pretty easy to create right there. And so you'll get this and then we're going to use the child care minimum standards um, 746-801. So I will put that in the chat screen right here. 746-801 um, as basically your table of contents. So what records must you keep on file at your child care center? And I've actually created a child care uh, licensing table of contents. So if you go to my website, tamthetrainer.com and go to documents, you can actually download um, this table of contents that has instructions on how to build your binder. So be sure to check that out. If you don't have it right now, it's okay. I'm gonna kind of go through here and tell you how to build this. It's pretty awesome, pretty easy. All right, and so I'm gonna kind of just go down the list of the records that you must have on file and we'll kind of talk about each one and then how to put it into your binder. So um, the first thing is children's records, all right? Obviously you must keep children's records on file at your program per page 38 of the minimum standards, 746-603, all right? Um, and so in your compliance binder, obviously you're not going to be able to put, you know, all 200 uh, children's records in your binder or however many kids you have. 
So what I suggest that you do um, on, on number one is that you put a sample child file in your binder. So whatever the forms look like that you use, all of the different forms that you use for children's records, you're gonna put that in the page protector. Now here's the important part, and this is what the purpose of this binder is. Um, so in the bottom right hand corner of your page protector, I'll kind of hold this up, you're gonna put an, an address label. And on that address label, you're gonna put children's records, 746-8011. And then here's the important part. Um, this is a sample child's file. The actual files are located in the filing cabinet next to the computer. All right, or, or next to the copier, wherever they're adding your program. The purpose behind this binder is so when your local licensing rep comes in, they're not spending the entire day chasing documents. Everything they need to view is gonna be right here in this binder. And if it's not here in the binder, we're gonna tell them exactly where to find it, okay? So right here, once again, with children's records, we're gonna have samples of the forms that we use. Um, and then on your address label, where are the actual files located? So like in this sample I have on here, filing cabinet next to the copier. So that way they know exactly where they're at, all right? Um, so that one's pretty easy breezy. You're just gonna put a sample in there for that one. Um, I see I got a question on um, Facebook. Uh, someone had just attended our director credential course um, back in May. Has any change, uh, anything changed since then? Um, we did have one additional document that was added in April of 2021. Um, and so if you attended our class in May, we should have discussed that additional item. And so we will get to that when we get to uh, number 22 on the list. That would be the only thing that would have changed right there. All right. Um, so uh, there you go. Uh, sorry, Letitia, that I'm not able to meet your needs with a Zoom, but um, that's why I'm holding things up to the screen right there. Uh, so unfortunately with Zoom, we wouldn't be able to do the Facebook Live part of it. So we have to make a compromise. We're gonna practice the power of acceptance right here. The moment is what it is. All right. Um, on number two, infant feeding instructions. So this is a really good one right here um, as well. Now again, in childcare uh, minimum standards, 746, 2421 um, requires us to have infant feeding instructions for those infants that are not eating table food, all right? And your infant feeding instructions have to be updated every 30 days. So basically what we're gonna do on this one is we're gonna have a sample copy of your infant feeding instruction and then your address label in the bottom right hand corner here is gonna say infant feeding instruction 746-8012. And then you'll say something like, current feeding instructions are located in the infant room in the purple binder. Uh, past infant feeding instructions are located in the child's file. Um, because on this one, you're gonna have two locations. You're gonna have the most current infant feeding instructions um, that your teachers are following right now. And then you're gonna have the previous feeding instructions, all right? So that's an important part of this page right here. Where are your current infant feeding instructions located and where are the ones that are older than 30 days uh, located? So that's what you'll put in your little page protector for number two on infant feeding instructions. Now let's say for example, you don't have infants, all right? So in your program, um, you do not service uh, infants. Maybe you don't start taking children until 18 months or two years. I would still have this page in your binder, and then I would put a cover sheet in here that basically says, you know, 746-8012, infant feeding instructions, and then put on here, our program does not um, enroll infants, not applicable. All right, so I wouldn't just leave it blank or skip it. I would put a page in here that basically says not applicable. All right, so that way again, it's very obvious to licensing that you're not missing anything. This is just not applicable to you. 
And we're going to come across this a few times as we go through this material, all right? Um, but that has been very, very helpful as well, okay? Uh, number three, uh, your personnel and training records, um, again, according to child care licensing. So again, you'll just put a, a sample copy of personnel records. Um, again, depending on how many employees you have, you're not going to be able to put a copy of everyone's file in here. So I would put a, a sample of the forms that you use. Um, and then, um, you know, again, on your address label, you'll just put uh, 746 8013 personnel records. Um, at here is a sample copy, and then actual records are located in the director's office and the filing cabinet behind the desk or wherever um, those are located. All right, same thing with training records. Um, you're just going to put a sample training record in here, so whichever form that you're using, and I like the form that is on Child Care Licensing's website. So many people ask me, hey Tim, have you created a document to help track training records? No, I haven't because the one that licensing has is really good, all right? So why reinvent the wheel when they've already created something that's pretty fantastic? And, you know, you're using their stuff, which they like that. So once again, here is a sample copy of our training records. Um, and then on your address label in the bottom right hand corner, you will put where the actual file is located. So once again, in my example, um, actual files are located um, in the director's office in the filing cabinet behind the desk or wherever they're located in your world. Okay. Um, uh, Pam is asking a really good question on the infant feeding instructions. For those of you that do participate in the federal food program, um, the infant feeding instruction form that is used for CACFP, that can be used for licensing as well. Um, all of the required information um, that licensing requires to be on the feeding instruction is also on that form for CACFP. So yes, there's no reason to create two different documents or use two different documents. Um, the one that you're using for food program is acceptable. So that's a very good question, Pam. I'll give you a gold star for that question. All right. Um, on the next one, number four, your child care licensing um, director's certificate. Now, I want you to have your original director certificate, you know, framed and mounted on the wall um, in your director's office or in your lobby so that it's in a prominent area um, and people can see it. So in your binder, you're just going to make a copy of your director's license and you'll put that right here. Um, once again, um, this is going to prevent when licensing comes in to do your monitoring visit, they don't have to go looking around your building for your director's license. Here's going to be a copy of it right here in your binder. So that's very helpful for them as well. Okay. Um, on number five, your attendance records or timesheets for, um, for your employees, all right? So once again, um, you're gonna put a sample time card in here. So you might notice that mine is a computer generated time card. We use ProCare uh, for our attendance tracking. Our employees sign in and out with their fingerprint. Um, so I'm just gonna put a sample copy of the time card in here. And once again, in the bottom right hand corner on your address label, attendance records or timesheets 746-8015, all right? And then you'll put um, current time cards are located in ProCare and are accessible by any member of management. And then previous time cards that are signed by the employees are located in the filing cabinet in the director's office or wherever they're located in your world. Okay, so because most of us keep time cards and attendance records electronically, so your current time cards are going to be located in your computer, whether you're using ProCare or some other um, child care management software system. So you're going to indicate that, um, you know, these are located in the computer and are accessible 
by any member of management. That's important because records have to be accessible. So whoever is in charge of the program at the time of the monitoring visit has to be able to have access to those time cards. And then the second part is previous time cards that are signed by the employees uh, are going to be located wherever you're putting them. All right, so two different things on that address label. Now, um, a little sidebar conversation for you. Um, I know that we're here to talk about, you know, our compliance binder, but this is a really important conversation when we talk about employee time cards and attendance records. Um, time cards and attendance records are required by two regulatory agencies. You are required to keep time cards and attendance records uh, for Texas Workforce Commission and for child care regulations. All right. So very, very important that you're having all employees sign in and sign out because it's required by two different regulatory agencies. Now, this is a very commonly cited standard. Lots and lots of programs get cited for number five. Whose time card do you think is normally missing? When licensing comes out, um, you know, to, to visit your program, whose time card is typically missing? It's the director's, all right? Even though you're a salaried exempt employee, you are still required to have attendance records or timesheets, all right? And once again, this is required by child care regulations and it's required by Texas Workforce Commission. Um, but because the director is a salaried exempt employee, um, that's the one that's typically missing. So make sure that you're clocking in and out just like everybody else. All right. That's going to keep you in compliance with both agencies. All right. Um, I got a really good question about how long do I have to keep signed time cards? Um, that's a good question. Um, Texas Workforce Commission can come back and audit your payroll records. They can go back seven years if they feel needed. All right. So seven years is what is typically suggested uh, for how long you keep these documents. All right. Um, because that's how long they can go back and do payroll audits is for seven years. Now, I'm going to tell you much longer than that. Um, the statute of limitations for how long a parent has to sue you or press charges against you um, is until the child turns 21. Okay, so if you were to have an incident that came up years later and there were charges filed against you or a lawsuit filed against you, um, those time cards on the employees that were present with the child when the incident occurred are going to be very, very critical. All right. And if you've thrown them away, you might have an issue. So I would recommend that you keep time cards indefinitely. That's just my recommendation. Um, you know, otherwise, seven years is, is what is um, recommended. All right. Um, yes, time cards always need to be signed by the employees, um, verifying that their time is accurate. All right. So before you process your payroll, you run your payroll, you send your time cards off to payroll. Um, your employees always need to verify that their time is accurate. OK, that's important. Um, it's been a while, but I do have a webinar on uh, the Texas payday law. So you might want to go back and review that that webinar I did on um, the Texas payday law. Um, probably it probably time for me to do an update on that. So I will add that to my list. Um, but I did it about a year and a half ago. The data is still current and up to date. Um, but, you know, with everything that's happened in our world over the last two years, probably a good idea to, to do it again. So that's a great suggestion. Okay, very good. Kind of moving on um, with our compliance finder, uh, proof of liability insurance. Now, again, this is one of the main reasons why we have this compliance binder. Whenever we receive our declaration page, 
uh, with our proof of liability insurance, we tend, tend to just file it away or stick it in a drawer and, you know, we forget about it. And then when licensing comes in and they want to verify that you are current on your liability insurance and that you are carrying the adequate amount of coverage, um, they're going to need to see that proof of current liability insurance. And now you're running around the office, you know, digging through files and digging through drawers trying to find it. So once you receive that updated um, proof of liability insurance, whenever you renew your policy, make a copy of it, stick it in your compliance binder under number six. All right. So you'll just put a copy in there. You should be good to go on that one. Now, remember, we do have some new regulations on um, liability insurance, on maintaining the minimum amount of liability insurance, $300,000. If you do not carry the minimum uh, liability insurance or you have exhausted your um, limits, then you have to notify your parents of that. Um, and so there's some, some new rules. You can go back and look in the standards on that right there. But if you're, you're maintaining your liability insurance, uh, you're good to go. The biggest tip right here is every year when you renew your policy, make sure you make a, a copy of the new uh, declaration page and put it in your compliance binder. All right, number seven are medication records. So if your program is serving medication, you're going to have your medication logs and you can refer to page 205 in the minimum standards, 746-3803 on what needs to be included on those medication logs, uh, basically child's name, uh, the date, um, the medication that is prescribed, um, the dosage, and the parent's signature, all right? And then you're gonna put those medication logs, um, once again, in your compliance binder, you're gonna put a sample. So you'll just make a copy of one and put it in your compliance binder. And then in your address label in the bottom right hand corner, um, you'll just put uh, sample medication log. The actual medication logs are located in the red binder on the left side of the front desk or wherever it's located in your world. Once again, if you are a program that does not administer medications, um, then don't just leave number six blank. Um, still create a page protector uh, for number six and then put, you know, numbers, or I'm sorry, number seven, um, put number seven, uh, medication records, not applicable. Our program does not administer medication or whatever that might look like in your world. Okay. Uh, number eight is going to be your playground maintenance checklist. So once again, you'll put a sample copy of your playground um, checklist in your binder. Um, and then you'll put on your address label, where are the actual records located? Now, this is where this book becomes very handy. So something that we do in my programs is that at the end of every month, uh, one of my administrators will get this binder and they will go through it page by page and they will check to make sure that all of the documents are current. And when we get to playground maintenance checklist, um, uh, safety documentation for emergency drills, fire extinguishers, and smoke detectors, this is a good way when, when at the end of every month you're going to go through this binder, did I do my playground checklist for the month? Um, did I do my fire drill for the month? Have I checked my fire extinguishers? Is it time for a severe weather drill? Is it, severe, is it time for a crisis drill? And it's going to help you stay in compliance. And if you do this at the end of the month, you're going to go, oh, wait, we haven't done a fire drill yet this month. We better do one right now. All right. So again, it, it keeps you <laughs> um, on top of things. Um, so it's a really good um, tool. Number nine is going to be uh, pet vaccination records. So if you have animals in your program that require vaccinations, uh, you'll just put copies of those vaccinations in your compliance binder. Um, you should be good with just doing that. Um, once again, if you don't have um, animals in your program, don't leave this blank. Go ahead and still do a page protector 
and you know put down there number nine pet vaccination records not applicable our program does not have any pets um, so once again it's very obvious that you're on top of this and you don't have any animals it's not that you have forgotten all right uh, number 10 I just talked about, but that is your uh, safety documentation for emergency drills, fire extinguishers, and smoke detectors. And again, um, at the end of every month or whenever it's good for you, um, then you'll just go through this book and see, oh, have I done a fire drill this month? Have I, have I done uh, my fire extinguishers? Um, and it, it helps keep you on track. All right. Now, um, if you want more information on this particular topic, I do have a webinar on handling significant events, and you can refer to that webinar more on emergency practices um, and how to deal with those types of situations, okay? But I'll just give you a really quick little overview. Um, the way I like to do it, especially whenever I was a director, um, I would plan my fire drills every other month and my assistant director would plan the opposite months. So I would do like January, March, you know, May, and then she would do February, April, June. Um, but we would take turns uh, scheduling our fire drills and we wouldn't tell each other, all right? Because we need to be drilled too, all right? And then, you know, if you have that toddler that pulls the fire alarm or the air conditioner repairman sets off the fire alarm and you have to evacuate your building, document that. All right, that counts as a drill. Um, you know, I live up here in North Texas and in springtime, you know, we're ducking and covering every other week. Um, I think we're, we have storms coming in today, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, if you feel the need to, to do a duck and cover, document that, that's your uh, severe weather drill for the, uh, for the month. Sorry, I didn't put my phone on silent. All right. Uh, so there you go on that one, and, and, and the most commonly missed item on number 10 is the fire extinguishers and the smoke detectors. So just kind of get into the routine of any time you do a fire drill, that's also when you check your smoke detectors and your fire uh, extinguishers. Um, that's the best practice right there. All right, on number 11, your most recent fire inspection. All right, so once again, whenever you have your annual fire inspection, just make a copy of it, put it in your compliance binder, you should be good to go. All right, um, this, is, this is also gonna be posted in your prominent area, so uh, parents, employees, and visitors can view, um, but just put a copy in your compliance binder, licensing is happy. Same thing with your sanitation inspection, uh, whenever you have a health inspection come in, so the health department comes in and does their little uh, check, you're going to have that posted in your prominent area, um, but you're also going to make a copy and put it here in your compliance binder. Um, and again, especially with the fire inspection, these are not people that just automatically come out every year. You typically have to call and schedule your fire inspection to be done, and they don't come quickly. So you need to start like 60 days out, you know, 60 days before you expire. You need to start calling and trying to get on their calendar, whoever does your fire inspections. Um, so that way, again, when you're going through this book at the end of every month, um, checking all of your due dates and making sure that you've done everything for the month, that's when you're going to notice, oh, wait, today is, you know, October 12th. And my fire, my fire inspection is due in December. I better start calling and scheduling that, all right? So again, it's going to help you stay on top of these due dates. That's very important, all right? Uh, number 13, if you have um, a gas inspection. So if your program has gas, then you'll put a copy of your gas inspection here in your compliance binder. Uh, once again, if you don't have gas in your program, don't just skip this one. Still make a little page for it and put number 13, most recent gas um, inspection, not applicable. Our building does not have gas. All right. So um, always make sure you do that. 
Uh, is the sanitation inspection the health department in most situations? Yes. All right, Danielle. Uh, the sanitation inspection is basically your health department um, that comes in and checks out. Now, there are some areas of the state that these are two different things. There is your health department visit, and then there's also a sanitation inspection. Most of them are one visit, but just make sure you check in your local area that that is the case. All right. Um, ah, thank you, Lynn. Um, I appreciate that. All right, going on on page 50, uh, number 14 is the most recent Texas Department of State Health Services Immunization Compliance um, form. So if your local health department comes out and does an audit of your immunizations, licensing has a right to review that audit. They actually really love this uh, because now they don't have to go through your immunizations. Um, and so you're going to, whenever you get that immunization audit, you're going to uh, make a copy of it, put it in your compliance binder, you're all set. Now, if you're in an area that you haven't um, had an immunization audit, then you'll just put a cover sheet in there saying that you have not received an audit uh, for your immunizations um, in your local area. Or maybe they haven't come in five years. All right, um, I was actually just talking to a school the other day that they haven't had an immunization audit in like five years. Go ahead and keep the most current one and just put a cover sheet in there that this is the most recent immunization audit um, that has been done in your local area. All right, um, but I actually just got a phone call from a school two weeks ago um, that received a notice that they were going to have their immunizations audited. So um, I guess they're, they're starting this back up. All right. Um, if you've got a question about immunization records, I would contact your local health department. They should be pretty standard across the state. So whether it be the state office or your local office, um, they should be able to answer any questions that you've got about immunizations. All right. Uh, that's a question that popped up on uh, Facebook right there, but they're pretty cut and dry. Uh, so they're pretty standard. All right, number 15, uh, same thing, your CACFP food program audit. So those of you that participate in the federal food program, whenever you have your annual audit, um, licensing has a right to review that. The reason is because uh, the federal food guidelines supersede minimum standards, all right? Um, they're higher standards than what is in this book. So once again, licensing has a right to review that audit. Now, um, you're just gonna make a copy of it, put it in your compliance binder. Once again, if you do not participate in the federal food program, still have a page protector for number 15 and just put a cover sheet in there that says, um, most recent Texas Department of Agriculture Child and Adult Care Food Program audit. Um, we do not participate in the food program, not applicable. All right, so still have that cover sheet in there. For those of you that participate in the Child Care Subsidy Program, um, number 16 is the most recent local workforce board child care services contractor inspection report. Um, so um, if you have one of these, um, you'll put a copy of it in your compliance binder. Once again, if you do not participate in the subsidy program, you'll just put a cover sheet saying not applicable, uh, we do not participate. Okay, so again, don't leave it blank, put a cover sheet in there. Uh, it, it makes it pretty um, self-explanatory. Now let's talk about uh, number 17. I'm actually gonna bring this up twice. Um, but on number 17, your record of pest uh, exterminations. All right. So once again, in your compliance binder, you're going to put a sample copy of a pest extermination record. And then on your address label, you know, in the bottom right hand corner, you're going to put, you know, sample copy of pest extermination records, the actual pest, um, pest extermination records are located in the blue binder in the director's office, all right? And I do recommend that your pest control records are kept in a separate binder um, for a couple of different reasons. 
Number one, uh, depending on how frequent you're having pest control, whether you're doing this every month or every other month, it's totally based on the needs of your business on, on how often you have pest control. Um, this can fill up really fast, all right? So this binder can get really thick really, really fast. And you could get a visit from the Texas Department of Agriculture wanting to audit your pest control records. That doesn't happen very often, but it could happen. And that's why I like for your pest control records to be in a completely separate binder. So once again, if the Department of Agriculture shows up, you can just hand them that one binder, okay? Um, but in your compliance binder, then we're just going to put a sample in there. All right, I'll bring this, oh, actually, the next one, number 18, is your Consumer Product Safety Commission, all right? Once again, I'm gonna put a sample in my compliance binder, a sample copy of a recall, and then a sample copy of the document that you sign stating that you have checked your program and that you do not have any unsafe or recalled items. You can download that form off of Child Care Regulations website, and then you'll have those two samples in your binder. Once again, you'll have your address label that says, um, you know, Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, documentation. Uh, here are samples. The actual documents are located in the white binder in the director's office. And this is another one that I recommend a completely separate binder for your recalls um, because this one, again, can get very, very thick, very, very fast, all right? And you don't want to muddy this up and make it cluttered, all right? So uh, there you go. And y'all know that y'all can go to cpsc.gov, so Consumer Product Safety Commission, cpsc.gov, G-O-V, and you can uh, sign up for e-blast. And so anytime there is a recall or an unsafe item, you're gonna get an email alerting you of this. When you go to that newsroom and you sign up for those e-blasts, make sure that you filter it to only receive children's products. Um, if you don't filter it, you're gonna get 25 emails a day, all right? So make sure you hit the filter and only receive children's products. And even then, you, you may not get everything, or everything you get may not be applicable to you, um, but it might be good for your parents, you know? So a piece of furniture, that um, a dresser that has been recalled. Now, we typically don't have dressers in our programs, but your parents might, so this is good information to share with them. All right, so yeah, uh, uh, Beverly's saying they put theirs online or on their parent portal. I think that's smart, that's, that's good. Okay, uh, 19 is going to be your daily tracking system for when a child's day begins and ends. So basically your sign in and out sheets. Um, and again, you know, any of y'all that have taken my director credential course, we talk about this one a lot. Um, one of the most important documents in your school, um, but making sure that you have record of when the child's day begins and when it ends who's dropping them off, who's picking them up. So in your compliance binder, you're gonna have a sample copy of a sign in and out sheet, and then on your address label, you'll say number 19, daily tracking of child's attendance. Um, here is a sample. Um, actual records are located in the red folder in the director's filing cabinet or wherever they're located in your world, all right? Um, so, but this again is such a huge, huge document, very, very important document in your program. You've got to have a, mo a documented moment in time when the responsibility of the child shifts from parent to caregiver and from caregiver to parent. It's like running a relay race and passing the baton. All right, at what point is the parent responsible for the child? At what point is the school responsible for the child? That's how critical that sign in and out sheet is. All right, um, whether you're doing it electronically, uh, whether you're doing pen and paper, we do both actually, um, you know, make sure that you've got that. 
And I actually recommend, um, we have it in our policy manual that if a parent fails to sign their child in or out, it's a $5 penalty per occurrence, okay? And it's not that I'm trying to make money um, off of the parents, it's, it's to get them to understand how critical this document is. All right, so just a suggestion for you right there. Uh, number 20, um, I just got a phone call on this one a couple of weeks ago. Someone had a question about number 20, um, but this is documentation that your cribs meet the federal crib guidelines. So once again, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has very specific guidelines that our cribs have to meet. And so your cribs must have a certificate of compliance. All right. And you can refer to page 129 in the child care minimum standards under the, the crib specifications for more information on this one. But whoever you're purchasing your cribs from should provide you with a certificate of compliance um, that your cribs meet the Consumer Product Safety Commission guidelines. And you're just going to take those certificate of compliances and you're going to put them in your compliance binder. All right, y'all, I got to tell y'all, this rule has been in place since 2011. I think in 2012, um, licensing asked for our crib compliance um, certificates. I don't think I've had a licensing rep ask me for my crib compliance forms since 2012. My very last licensing visit that, that occurred about three weeks ago, they asked for them, all right? Uh, now we had them and so everything was good, but I was kind of like, whoa, they haven't asked for this in a long time, but she sure did, all right? Um, and she was specifically looked for those uh, certificate of compliance on the cribs. Um, I got a question, um, can a teacher sign a student in or out um, if you're doing um, like a carpool line or, or whatnot? Technically, according to child care licensing, yes. Um, the signing, sign in and out can be done either by an employee or the parent. However, I'm going to strongly recommend this is done by the parent, all right? Um, if you were to have a significant event and a child was injured after the child was signed out, all right, um, it's going to be very difficult for you to protect yourself if your employees were the one that signed the child out, okay? So from a, from a risk management standpoint, strongly encourage that this is done by the parents. Okay. And actually, um, Danielle, thank you for the, uh, for the lead in. Um, on Thursday of this week, so um, coming up on Thursday, I'm actually doing, uh, my Tim at 10 is going to be on enrollment um, practices. Um, so we're going to talk more about the sign in and out sheet on Thursday when we talk about enrollment um, practices. So uh, tune in for that. All right. We just got a couple of more left right here. Um, number 21, uh, for those of you that are transporting children, you need to have documentation of when you acquired your vehicles. So the documentation of the date that you um, acquired that vehicle, and that needs to be in your compliance binder as well. All right. So you'll put that in there. Now, once again, if you are not transporting children, so you do not own buses or vans, um, then you'll just put uh, a cover sheet in here that says not applicable, we do not um, own vehicles. All right, so don't just leave it blank, still put a cover sheet in there. Um, and, and that way it's, it's obvious that you didn't just miss it, uh, you don't have vehicles, okay? And then 22 is the newest item, all right? So 22 is something that's brand new. And that's gonna be proof that you have notified parents in writing of deficiencies in uh, safe sleeping and um, abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So one of the new rules that we have with child care minimum standards is that if you get a deficiency for abuse, neglect, or exploitation, or if you get any deficiency related to infant sleep safety guidelines, you have to notify all of your parents in the program in writing. 
So uh, you're going to make a copy of that letter and you're going to put it in your compliance binder. Now the goal here is that on number 22, you're going to put a cover sheet in here that says, we have not received any deficiencies rela related to um, uh, safe sleeping or abuse and neglect not applicable. And that's what I want you to have in this compliance binder all the time. <laughs> all right, knock on wood. All right, um, but if you do receive that deficiency, then the copy of the letter that you send out needs to be included in your binder. All right, now, so we've gone through the list of everything you're gonna put in here, all right? And so it's gonna take a little bit of work, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but I think that you will find um, this is gonna be very, very beneficial to you. Um, uh, uh, number 20 was your crib compliance. For those of you that service infants, uh, you need to have a certificate of compliance um, in your binder. And once again, yeah, so I need to, um, Jennifer, thank you. I do need to update the document that's on my website to include number 22. Um, I created this document prior to that new standard coming out. Um, I will make sure that I get that updated, but you can download this table of contents um, off, of, off of my website, timthetrainer.com, but also you can refer to page 49 and 50 in the child care minimum standards, and you can use uh, page 49 and 50 as your table of contents too, all right? Uh, so yes, you're only going to have a number 22 if you have received a deficiency related to infant sleep, sleep safety guidelines or abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Otherwise, you're going to have a cover sheet that says, we have not had any deficiencies not applicable. Now, this is what generally happens. And, and, and again, I've been practicing this for, gosh, 20 years now. I've been making compliance binders, all right? Um, and so usually licensing will come in and they'll say, hey, I'm here to review your, your documents. And then you just hand them your binder. And this is what I typically see them do. They'll typically pick up your big book and go, looks good. All right, move on. Um, and so, you know, they, they really, really like it. And it shows them that you're organized, that you've got it together, that you're on top of things. And so it's just a really, really good tool. All right. So I've got a couple of questions that are coming in. Um, uh, Danielle, um, you know, put some page numbers up there. Y'all make at the bottom of your child care minimum standards, make sure you've got the June 2021 version. Um, there's a May 2021 version and there's a June 2021 version. So if you haven't downloaded and printed the, 20, the June, um, make sure you got that because the difference between the, the April, May and the June is one page. So uh, there might be a one page discrepancy depending on the version that you've got. There were no changes to the rules. Um, it was changes in formatting is the difference between the two books right there. Uh, Brenda is asking, how can we get um, the crib compliance certificate? You're gonna contact whoever you bought those cribs from, all right? So Discount School Supply, Lakeshore, Kaplan, School Specialty, wherever you brought, uh, bought your cribs, they're going to get you your certificate of compliance. All right. So, um, and you, like I know on Discount School Supply, you can pull them right off of their website. All right. I'm trying to look at these questions that are coming in, and my screen is not cooperating with me. All right. Um, on, on state regulations for immunizations for teachers, we have no, com um, we have no standard on that. Basically, this is going to refer to your vaccine preventable disease guidelines you basically get to write this policy as you choose. Based on the assessment of your program, you get to decide what immunizations you want for your employees. But as far as the state is concerned, they have no specific um, requirements for immunizations for staff. The only exception to that would be check your local health department on whether or not TB tests are required in your area, okay? Um, but otherwise, refer to your vaccine preventable disease guidelines. All right, that's a good question. Um, so uh, Kristen is saying that on her most recent inspection, they asked for playground compliance and materials used. 
So I would just put that, um, I think that's a good thing to do under number eight, your playground maintenance. Um, you can include those documents uh, that your, your playground equipment, um, that you're using it according to manufacturer's recommendations and that it's uh, compliant playground equipment. Um, now, I personally keep a completely separate binder for all of my playground equipment with all of this information. So, um, and, and actually, uh, Kirsten, my last licensing visit, they asked for this as well. So this must be one of their, their hot points right now um, because she specifically asked for uh, the manufacturer's recommendation uh, on my playground equipment, but we have it all in one binder. We just pulled it out and gave it to her easy breezy. Okay. Um, on your infant feeding instructions, um, as far as licensing is concerned, um, yes, you only need to keep the previous ones for three months. Um, I'm going to recommend that you keep these much longer. Um, I'm going to recommend that you keep them indefinitely because once again, you know, that's the statute of limitations um, on how long a parent can file charges against you or sue you until the child turns 21. So I would keep them indefinitely. All right. Um, I mean, Pooja, uh, Pooja's asking, so, so we have to make copies of the new licensing rule book, June, 2021. Um, I recommend that you do. I mean, if you have the May one, you're probably going to be okay. Um, but there, there was, there is a slight difference between the May and the June book. Um, I would print, I would print another copy if I were you. Okay. Um, Jennifer is asking, do we need a uh, documentation on playground equipment like tricycles and scooters? Not a bad idea. Y'all, any piece of furniture e or equipment that a child could be injured on, I would always make sure that you keep documentation with the manufacturer's recommendations. All right. So um, I think for tricycles and scooters, you can put this in your playground um, binder. Um, it's not a bad idea. All right. But any furniture or equipment that children could potentially get injured on, I would get uh, or maintain the documentation with the manufacturer's recommendations um, on there. All right. So, yeah, Donna is saying that her local licensing rep doesn't ask for half of this stuff. Typically, they don't, honestly, um, but you've got it if they do ask for it. And like I said, normally, 99% of the time, when I hand them my compliance binder, they usually will go, all right, looks good, and they move on. All right, so, uh, you know, that, that's always a good thing right there. But like I said, this is just gonna help you stay in compliance, help you with those deadlines, help you make sure that you're doing all the monthly tasks that need to be done. Um, and it's just a good way of, of being organized. All right, so that is our little webinar today on creating your compliance binder. Um, um, oh, Jody has a really good question as I was wrapping up. Um, she got it, she just snuck it in there. Uh, so yes, one of the new standards that we got in April of 2021 is that you do need to have a policy on physical activity. Um, there's a lot of elements to that. There are several things that need to be listed in that policy, uh, but one of them is your plan for providing physical activity when weather permits. So that's just going to be included in your policy manual. All right. So your parent policies, employee policies, um, and so make sure you've got that. And if you need a sample, um, if you go to my website, timthetrainer.com, I have a sample policy on physical activity um, that you can use to make sure you're in compliance. All right. Uh, so yes, um, uh, BJ, yes, if you go to my website, timthetrainer.com, you can download a sample table of contents for the compliance binder. Just make sure you add number 22. Um, I need to get that updated since that was a new one. All right, You're, for those of you that are wanting a certificate of completion for today, um, the link to complete your online worksheet should be on Facebook now. So just refresh your browser or scroll to the top and you should see it. Um, I will also put it in the chat screen um, here as soon as we are done. If you came in late today, um, please make sure you go back and watch the beginning of the video. 
Um, you do need, do need to watch the entire video uh, for it to be an instructor-led training. So that's pretty important. Let's make sure that we're being honest and completing our worksheets with integrity um, and that you're watching the whole video. Same for any of the videos that we have on our website. All right, so once again, yes, the table of contents for the compliance binder, um, oh, for the compliance binder is on my website, timthetrainer.com. Now for my policy manual, um, you can go to my website, timthetrainer.com and go to training modules for sale and the child care survival guide um, includes sample policies, um, processes, and forms uh, for your program. So a sample copy of a parent handbook, employee handbook, as well as uh, lots and lots and lots of other documents are in the child care survival guide. That is for sale on my website, timthetrainer.com. So not going to give you that one for free. Sorry. All right. <laughs> um, all right, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. Um, if you do have severe weather this afternoon, be safe. Um, continue to be healthy. And I will see all of you on Thursday. Oh, oh, don't forget, we have director workshop on Friday and teacher workshop on Saturday um, of this week. So um, on Friday for director's workshop, we're going to go over um, 10 steps to moving past the pandemic. So that's going to be a really good one. Um, and on Saturday, we're going to do some STEM training and understanding the engineering design process, um, which is really good for the teachers. So something a little different and new. I'm excited. All right, everyone have a great afternoon. I'll see you soon. Bye.